Hi everybody, my name is Miro. I'm the author of Zaitanaba, which is a distributed workflow orchestration platform written in Clojure. I'll be talking a little bit about distributed systems and microservices. Super excited to be here you know, today, albeit virtually. So let's get started. Uh, let's start with something fun. So let's pretend for a little bit that, you know, instead of software engineers, we are spaceship engineers and we are actually in charge of some space travel. So let's let's maybe pretend that our goal today is to take astronaut instead of some program and deploy to some planet. So instead of you know a server. So usually we would deploy astronauts to planet using some spaceships. And once they get there we would just broadcast to them some you know transmission via radio, maybe give them instructions. But here's the thing about space. It's in a hospitable place. Many things can go wrong, right? Uh, spaceships can fail. They can hit objects maybe in space. You need to configure them. You need to maintain them. It's not an easy task. If you receive some distress signal from some derelict ship and you go investigate, we you know, all know how it ends up. Um, but we are smart people. We are smart engineers. And we've been asked by this astronaut, so that will be our program you know let's call her Ellen Ellen wants us to help with the space show because it's hard she has her small spaceship it might be called I don't know JS or Jerry or something like that uh, and you can see straight away this is not an elegant solution is it but we are very smart uh, engineers and we sit you know and think long and hard about this problem and we come up with this brilliant solution so we just built a bigger ship and we put the original spaceship in it right and if you step outside and look from the outside and basically the original spaceship disappeared you no longer need to maintain it or configure it it's been taken care of right so everybody is happy uh, there still might be few naysayers and you know glass half empty type of people who complain that they don't have much visibility into where they are flying to or they can't steer properly so we just built more spaceships we call them sidecars and attach them to the container ship right but then you have all these spaceship factories on earth it's still not elegant maybe if you want to really really scale and maybe colonize the whole universe we can still you know build even bigger spaceships and we can put the spaceship factories in them and maybe ship it you know to uh, the edge of solar system and pretty much you know if you are on earth it's been taken care of there are no factories there are no spaceships um it's basically all automated right you still may need to train the astronauts get them to the space station put them in ships uh, then to container ships and you know then tell them where to fly to but apart from that you know it's solved problem but here's the thing what if maybe we've been focusing on the wrong problem like these ships are certainly technological marvels and it's fun to play with them uh, but maybe we've just become too attached to them so what maybe with space exploration and travel, maybe this would be you know, one possible approach, maybe this would help us. So maybe teleports would be a good thing, right? What if we just needed, you know, in some cases teleports and we've just been given more and more spaceships? So let's step back and let's look at this you know, analogy from the IT perspective. So what does it mean, uh, teleports? versus spaceships uh, well here on on the left hand side basically this is the traditional approach we usually take when we build distributed systems and we deploy microservices right so you write some program you put it into some uh, server like web application server it could be like jetty or node.js or something and then you basically deploy it into some container and put it on server right and then uh, this would be some usually program written in something usually it's some object-oriented program it maintains its state especially when running in the uh, web server uh, you communicate with it via you know some imperative API you predefine like either via REST or gRPC it's pretty much the same and it's bound to one address space on the other hand you know if you just build programs that are distributed in nature uh, you don't ship the whole system, you don't ship the whole web server, you just write a program um, that you know depicts the logic you need to execute and then you have it somehow serialized and sent over 
uh, to the servers where you need you know it executed so you just send the whole logic and by nature the, the program maintains its own state even though it's crossing boundaries between servers uh, and for this approach usually what's more suitable than OOP it will be the functional programming paradigm or the data flow programming paradigm uh, and pretty much you know your API that you are using is the programming language right so you have declarative pretty much during complete API that you can involve and the you focus more on the workflow so end to end what you need to perform you you are not just thinking in terms of the each particle atomic operation like when it you know like in case of microservices so you define the workflow you can call it abstract syntax tree or di you know directed um, acyclical graph or you can have some dsl and with that you define what needs to be executed so this is usually address space agnostic right you might have some security concerns like what happens if somebody breaches the teleport like if some alien line form gets there it might be more concerning than you know if in traditional approach somebody breaches this planet then you know it's pretty much enclosed system right so that, that, that there are certain upsides and downsides to this so let's have a look at the history like, do we have teleport do we have this approach you know of course we do of course we've been using it and pretty much everybody's been using it maybe even without knowing uh, so there's a whole paradigm called data flow programming which basically models the programs as some directed graphs and these graphs then can be distributed across you know network and clustered of computers um, and basically that kind of makes of you know network transparent distributed programming model so there are many many very interesting papers in this regard i'm just listing here a few um, notable work by bob sutherland um, pretty much a pioneering work in terms of like specifying first graphical representation of a programs that can then be distributed across computers ostrovsky's work is also quite notable main point here in his notion of what he calls life distributed objects is that programs pretty much can be orthogonal to the underlying infrastructure and you know, the underlying runtime um, and there are all, of course uh, multiple languages already that kind of employ this distributed programming approach so there are languages that by nature are distributed um, I'm listing here a few like Hume you know it's a Haskell-like distributed uh, programming language kunai uh, form which is basically written in Erlang and many others but these are pretty niche usually use them you know to process some data but in uh, you know in your favorite programming languages or in mainstream programming languages usually if you build distributed systems you just build it using the distributed protocol so you either uh, you know make some rest calls uh, behind the uh, scenes or you use some RPC um, you know, a couple of decades ago, Corba was big hit these days. GRPC, it's pretty cool, but it, it, it's quite the same. You have, you know, IDL, which is interface definition language, and you define, you know, the interface in it, and then you can make calls. And it, even though it crosses network and goes over to some different address space, it feels like you are actually, you know, invoking your own code. We have RMI in Java land. It's been around. It's, it's pretty good. Um, making a note here of Apache Spark. Uh, you would think Spark is written in Scala, it runs on JVM, so you would think it uses RMI, but when you invoke Spark context, then it sends uh, data for processing to other uh, servers. But in reality, if you lo look at Apache Spark's code base, you would see that it just takes the functions and methods you want to invoke, and it serializes them and invokes them on the other end. So this is, you know, in some, in some circles probably this would be considered a heresy but still it's a part of mainstream technology everybody's been using uh, and it pretty much resonates and corresponds with the data flow programming approach so let's jump into REPL and let's have some fun with programming and with closure uh, programming is very you know closure is very suitable for building distributed systems because simply it's functional language and also we have the sense of homo iconicity which means that the program is also 
the same as the data and vice versa. So I have here two REPLs. These are separate REPLs as far as we are concerned, concerned this could be running on separate servers. And I will make use of the core async concept. So I, I will define some channels. So let me define this channel my chain in one and again in the other. But this is not ordinary async channel which would work only on one machine. This is a distributed type. And if I, it's basically I'm using libraries from Titanova which rely on some underlying message queue. And if I here send you know, into the new channel, I send this map with this message. I'm using the uh, core async command or function for uh, putting the message on, on queue. So I send it here in this, this repo and in the other one I can consume it. So here you can see even though we are in different address space, we got the message. But this is nothing ordinary, uh, you know, extraordinary. It's pretty common, right? Using some messaging, messaging uh, systems. But what we can do next is that here we define another channel. We call it response channel. Maybe we'll use it for getting responses from the other server. And then we can also define more complex message. So now to this channel, we'll send a map with these uh, key value pairs. So we'll have some message here and we will send also not only data, but we'll have some, we'll send some instructions. So we have here anonymous function that we'll send over. We'll provide input for that function. And here's you know, the response channel where uh, the other side should respond one, once they invoke the function with the parameters and they should written us the result. So this pretty much you know feels like teleporting and teleport, right? We take a we created a new queue and we are sending it over the wire to some other system. So let's consume the message here. So we have the message we can even check how the message looks. And you can see we got it, right? And now we can execute the function we, we've been given and return back. So here will respond, will respond to the respond channel, so resp chain, and we'll send back the original message just to you know for sake of uh, consistency, and we'll attach this key result with the value basically taking the function we've been given and applying it to the input, right? And here we can check whether we've got it and whether, yeah. So here's the result. It's very simple, hello world. Uh, but we basically accomplished it, you know, spanning multiple uh, address spaces. So that's, that's interesting. And I can jump, you know, very quickly back into the presentation. So. Basically, this very approach I'm using in Titanoba, it just they, does the same thing. It just you know, serializes the work as some graph. So you can define some workflow that you need exec to execute. Uh, it's basically a graph. And this way, we can distribute it over many, many nodes. Uh, and it makes for quite a flexible type of workflow system. So maybe let's you know, play with it. A little bit more. So here I have the Titan bar running in AWS, and I have some workflows here. So just you know, similar type of hello world uh, workflow. Basically, here I have some hello world. It's slightly more complex, but not that much. It takes a parameter name. It creates a PDF using this function. It prints you know some hello world in it and it then uploads it to s3 and then send it will send me a slack message uh, sending link to that particle pdf so i can invoke it either i can invoke it from here i can even send you know a request from uh, postman so i can say here maybe 
and if I send it, I'm gonna, yeah, and here I got the Slack message, and I can open it, and you can see we got the hello world message, right? So that's that's pretty cool, I think, but it's not the main thing I wanted to uh, talk about today. So let's have some fun with data. I have here some data files that need processing in 2020. For some reason, a lot of genomic data, genomic sequencing data became publicly available on the internet. I have no idea why that, but let's have some fun with that. So I have here some fast few files. These are basically files from genomic sequencing. And these files are just textual files. So if you are not familiar with bioinformatics, just don't be scared. These are just you know, strings, basically. These are files full of strings. These are uh, the nucleotides the, for nucleotide bases. So each letter represents either adenine, cytosine, guanine, or, or thiamine. Uh, and basically, you can just see here all these strings. And we will do to, today some very simple exercise, which is called you know, KMER count. It's count, counting the substrings. So I can say, you know, I need to count substrings of three. So this would be three mares or sub substrings of four. This would be four mares. And basically, uh, this is one three mare. This is another one. This is another one. And this counting of K mares can become CPU heavy operation. It can require some memory. So it's not a simple exercise, even though you know it's not that hard. So we can create some workflow. Uh, to process this file and to create a camera count. So I will create a workflow here. I'm going to call it camera count. Now uh, I could, it's not that hard, we could implement this functionally probably in a few minutes, but to save time, I already have it here. So I already created it. So here's the code. Basically, it's, it's, there's one function to count the KMERS and I may need to do some parallelism so I have some function to split the processing and what I need because it's you know I have this on in Maven repo so because I haven't worked with it I may need to import this dependency right so I take this dependency I already I think included it here yeah so I already do have it but if I didn't, I would just you know, copy paste it here and save it and it would get automatically uh, updated on the server side. So I have the dependency here um, and I can just so I have auto, auto complete here so we can camera and then this would be the camera count and here I'm also having some sample property, so we would be invoking this function, and I would need these properties. So you can see again, we are just creating some graph. So this this is you know this is just some map with some values in it that defines the workflow. It's it's nothing else. And we can, so here I have the file, we can use that. I can save it. Also, I have REPL here, so we can even Evaluated it. I, basically, the, the properties I defined here are automatically accessible using this value. So if I just hit Control Enter, I can see the values, and in the same fashion, basically, here I can just see from the file the first, I think, from first 12 lines, uh, these are the top KMRs. So it, it worked. Uh, just you know, validating this variable, but the file is huge and I may need some parallelism, right? So I need to add another 
workflow. And again, we don't have that much time, so I predefined the workflow here. So it's again just data, just graph, and I can update it here. So this will run over the file, it will split it in multiple parts and then invoke the KMER count workflow on each part and each you know, of these KMER counts will return top and so here's top 10 frequencies from the KMER count. So it will count the substrings and return us the results. But here's the thing, we have a you know, few minutes um, this will run on this particle file is huge it would run like 20 for 20 minutes so what shall we do uh, should I panic uh, should I call organizers uh, we need more time well I have here this workflow which is called add notes and what it does again it's just another you know it's just another graph and I can just invoke this and say how many instances I need to add to this cluster and it's going to be added so so far this has been just one cpu t2 micro instance so it's pretty tiny so i'm going to add more now so we'll add 20 nodes to the cluster again i'm adding just two two um t2 micro instances so please don't tell anyone in the data science community because they would bash me for that i should probably use c5 or some large servers for that but you know this is just a demo and you can see already some nodes are coming up so and we have 21 so it's 20 plus one so we got them all if you don't know why is that it they came up so quickly maybe there's a thing or two you need to learn about cloud computing uh everybody complains about jvm startup time and everything but still there are ways how to approach this issue so that was that you know we can see on here the job for adding nodes completed we have the instance I, I, ids here so let's start kmer okay, map reduce and we'll we'll sorry, we'll split into 20 parts and we are running so just to summarize while we are waiting for this to uh, finish what we've just seen we basically taken some maven dependency so it was just some code right we deployed it into our server so that that leveraged the ability of jvm to just you know load classes during runtime and without any type of packaging we didn't have to you know compile the code we didn't have to build any docker images we didn't have to deploy them into repository we didn't have to up update any zookeeper servers we didn't have to update our uh, cluster and restart a master node right it pretty much smoothly ran during runtime and you can see this is running it's basically processing the file it's playing it and we might need to wait a little bit more we should see cpu slowly picking up at some stage when the counting starts yeah and now we should see the splitting finished right so now we have multiple jobs that are running we have 20 jobs that are running in parallel and counting the occurrences and now we just wait so while we wait one i know very good distributed systems joke i might tell you to you know spend the time but it's i'm not sure it would get to everybody in the audience here so i might not tell it and we can see already the jobs some of the jobs are finishing so slowly but it's not you know it's not taking 20 minutes as it would if we were running 
we should see already you know the CPU load in the cluster is picking up which means the nodes are actually doing something so some of the nodes you can see are working hard and if I open one of the jobs we should see in properties the counts of gamer so each of these workloads will finish with some portion of the file so it will basically count these lines from the start to end uh, in the in the fast view file and here are the counts and the uh, reduce function here will basically merge all these together and adds everything all together right and we finished so pretty much here's the final job and ladies and gentlemen i give you here the final KMR counts for this particle large file. So that's it. We managed in time, I think. Uh, uh, so thank you very much. I'm looking forward to Q&A session uh, coming up. And if you would excuse me now, I'm going to stop all these instances just to save some money on my AWS bill.